Good afternoon and welcome to the Beat the GMAT and Stratus Admissions Counseling Webinar. Today we are covering Pick Your Own Top 10 MBA Programs. This is Susan Sira. I am here with my colleague Harold Szymanski. And as we wait for some more folks to join us here at the top of the hour, I'm going to ask a couple poll questions so Harold and I have a good sense of who's listening and we can customize our presentation to meet your needs. So first off, First question is, where are you located? As you're sitting here in the world today, where are you sitting? I'm, I'm in that top bucket, U.S. east of the Mississippi, as is Harold. Yep, so yes, I am, northeast. Harold's in the northeast. I am in the southeast, where maybe we'll get close to 100 degrees today. <laughs> um, so we've got polls coming in. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm at, the question is, where are you located? Where are you sitting today in the world? We've got about a third of our attendees are east of the Mississippi in the U.S. Um, a little over 50% are in Asia. And then the remainder are evenly split on uh, west of the U.S. and um, in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, although we do have at least one person who clicked other. I'm always curious as to where you are. So um, if you can go in the chat, person who is outside of uh, the, the kind of standard places, I'm always anxious to know where you are. And thanks for being with us. All right, I'm going to close out this poll and ask another. When do you plan to start an MBA? Are you looking to apply kind of in the next uh, six months? to start a program at this time next year? Or are you a, an early starter um, thinking about applying perhaps in 2019? Or maybe this is just an exploratory um, webinar for you and you're not really sure. So we got a bunch of votes in here. Maybe wait for a few more. We've got about 90% of people are gonna be applying this year to start a program next summer in 2018 and the rest are evenly split between 2019 and not quite sure. So thanks for that. One more question before we jump in, and it is how many programs, how many MBA programs do you plan to apply to? Um, we always advise people that, to get, get a long list. Don't just have one or two, but you know, there are different strategies uh, depending on where you are in the admissions process. So appreciate your vote here. We've got um, most people, we've got kind of an even split across uh, about a third, a third, a third between two and three schools, four and five schools, and six or more schools. But there's one person who's just applying to one school. So hopefully that person uh, you know, has done their research and that's the right school for them. All right, I'm going to close that out and let's get started here again. You are with us today for the Stratus Admissions Counseling and Beat the GMAT webinar. Today we are talking about pick your own top 10 MBA programs. Uh, and this is Susan Sira. I'm here with Harold Szymanski and let's get started. Whoops, and jump right to Harold. Uh, my name is Susan Sira. I am the Director of MBA Admissions Counseling at Stratus. I did my undergrad at Dartmouth College where I studied economics and computer science. Coming out of undergrad, I worked in consulting for a couple of years before going back to school to get my MBA at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Out of business school, I pivoted to working uh, as a product manager in a number of uh, high tech and internet firms. Um, keep in mind that this was probably almost your entire lifetime ago for those who are listening. So it was kind of a really hot place to be. It was like the equivalent of being in FinTech. Uh, to be working in the software space back in the early 90s. Um, did that rat race for about a decade and then turned my focus to my family, at which time I moved back to North Carolina and joined uh, the admissions team at Fuqua, where I worked for about a decade reading applications. And it was during this time, you know, in reading thousands, probably tens of thousands of essays that I realized uh, that a lot of students or a lot of applicants um, didn't really understand the process. So I, I switched gears and moved over to Stratus. And what I really love about my work is helping um, clients to understand what applying for MBAs is all about and really to help them find the schools that are the right fit for them and really connect to those programs as they put their applications together. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Harold Szymanski. 
Hey, Susan, thank you very much. I am Harold Szymanski. I'm one of the senior MBA admissions counselors. As you can see, I went to, I got my MBA from MIT Sloan and then spent a couple of years at Bain & Company, including their private equity group. And then after that, I sort of followed my heart and became an entrepreneur in all sorts of different industries with all sorts of different companies, some my own, some others, some successful, some less successful. And right now I do some work for a private equity firm as well as I'm one of the admissions counselors here at Stratus. And I'll tell you honestly, I don't love this slide, I don't love this picture for the simple reason that it shows just me. And the reality Stratus all, is all about team. You know, we always tell people what's our point of differentiation, team, team, team. For most of you, that means in real terms that you'll probably touch about four to six of us over the course of our relationship. Maybe you'll start off with Josh or Claire in customer service who make sure that everything is going smoothly no matter how small. Then you'd be matched with a counselor you know, after that, you'll have a senior strategist who is someone who really overlooks your and the things you've done with the counselor. And finally, there'll be school specific readers, meaning as you complete your essays, based on the school, it will go to different people. So the person who reads Harvard Business School will not read Stanford, who will not read Wharton. We'll have three different readers at that point. We then have a proofreader and an interviewer. The one thing just to talk about going back to counselors a little bit is Brendan, who you may have met, as well as other members of our staff, take the relationship and the matching of counselors very seriously. As you can see on our website, you're looking at, as of right now, 22 different counselors, you know, all shapes and sizes. Essentially, all of them have gone to M7 schools. So based on who you are, what your interests are, what your personality is, what schools you're applying to, then we really spend a lot of time making sure that you match at the counselor level and, of course, beyond that, the senior strategist level. Talking about other points of differentiation, we have what's called our four school guarantee, which means if you have signed up with us for score, four schools or more, then if you do not get into any one of those schools for whatever reason, then you can do the process again. You know, for some of you, that might mean do some this year, do some next year. For some of you, it might be round one, see what happens, and maybe do more schools in round two. But the point here is that this process really ends with you going to business school. And that is our goal, it is our entire team's goal, and obviously it is your goal, and we work very hard to make that happen, to the point that I can say we are very good at what we do. By all means, check us out, speak to our former clients, look at what people say about us on Yelp, on uh, uh, Google, on you know all sorts of different uh, review sites. Uh, we are very good at what we do, and, we, and the reason for that is we work very closely to understand who you are and why you have made this decision to go to business school. And right. So with that, um, things to consider as you think about business school. I'll let Harold hit this. Okay, sure. You know, obviously, national rankings are important. You know, as part of that process, you should really be looking at average test scores, GPA, career placements, really to make sure that this is the school for you and this is a school that really is possible for you. More importantly, though, what it comes down to is what your goals are, you know, what your experience to date is, you know, and how you will match up with the school across a number of different dimensions, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And for example, schools, there are many different rankings. So for an, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, you know, maybe you'd find a school like Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, one of the top MBA schools, you know, right for you. Maybe it's healthcare, in which case WashU and St. Louis pops up. Again, a school that you may not know. Uh, obviously, you'll have your, you know, your real dream schools there. Uh, but at the same point, there may be other schools for you to consider. And, you know, on that note, I'm going to pass it to Susan as she starts talking to you about, you know, what to consider during this application process. Great. Thanks, Harold. I'm going to ask um, another question here that maybe I should have asked before Harold hits this slide, but I'll leave it up while this slide is on. What matters to you when you're picking a school? You know, as you think about what schools you're, you're wanting to apply to, um, this is a question where you can pick as many as you want. Um, you know, what are the things that are important? We, ha we have clients who come to us and say, you know, all I care about is going to Harvard, Wharton, or Stanford. And, and that's one way to approach this. Um, other things to, to look at are, um, you know, whether or not the school has the resources that match with your goals and your experience, whether, where that school is located, uh, cultural fit, and then perhaps return on investment. 
Um, so I'm going to read these out since we've got them. Uh, most of you guys have responded. I've got 71% and these numbers are changing because more people are responding. About 70% um, say national rankings, 65% match with goals and experience, 55% location, 50, roughly 50% cultural fit, and 75% return on investment. So thank you for your time on that. And one more question before we, we move forward into the guts of this webinar. What schools are, your, are you considering? Um, and they're kind of, these are pick one. It's like only M7, top 20 only, or, or really any school that's going to help me get from where I am today to where I want to be. And there's a lot of schools in that top 20. There are probably 25 schools in the top 20, all great schools. Um, so I appreciate the, the votes in here. And I'll just wait another couple of people to vote here. We've got about 20% uh, only, M M7 only, about 60% top 20, and then 20% um, any, any schools at all. All right, so thanks for answering that. I'm going to close this poll so that it disappears off your screen, and let's move forward here with the, with the presentation. Areas to consider. So as you're thinking about your needs, um, we like to talk about C's, and uh, depending on what we're looking at, the C's to consider here are competitiveness. And this is really all about the numbers. Think about your competitiveness as um, it relates to the profile of students in any school. You know, is your GMAT at or above their GMAT average? Or is it even within that 80% range? If you're outside of the 80% range on the low end, you better bring it somewhere else. Um, so things that you need to be looking at in terms of competitiveness, Actually, I'm going to go deeper on these. So it's just these six C's we're going to drive down on. So the next is connections. Who are you talking to to understand what you know about these schools? You really need to you know, go beyond just looking at websites and you know, reading um, you know, guides that might be available online. You need to interact with people, ask personal questions, and get answers that are specific to you. Curriculum. So what is it that you're going to learn in the classroom and how are you going to learn it and with whom that's going to help you to get from where you are to where you want to be. Clubs, this goes beyond clubs, but just kind of anything outside of the classroom, uh, conferences, seminars, case competitions, community and culture. You know, who are the people at this school and are they your people? Are you going to be comfortable and happy there for your two years? And are these going to be people you want to engage with moving forward? And finally, um, you know, 70 something percent of you said that return on investment is important. Um, cost. You know, this is not a small undertaking. So you really do need to consider cost when thinking about what schools you're applying to. So with that, let's go to competitiveness. Um, and Harold, I think I've got this slide. So things that you need to be looking at are your standardized test scores. And I said it earlier, you need to be kind of within that 80% range to be. Um, even targeting these schools. If you're below the 80% range, definitely um, you know, a stretch school for you. And I like to say that you know, the M7 schools are a stretch for you regardless of you know, what your scores are. You know, we've had clients who had you know, 780 uh, GMAT and you know, aren't getting invitations to interview at you know, top 15 programs. Um, so there's more than just the, the test score. If you are, you know, we, I know that about 50% of our attendees when we ask the question are in Asia. If English is not your first language, or if you were not educated in an English speaking undergrad institution, uh, you might be required to take the TOEFL. So your ability to keep up with English, both in writing, listening, speaking, um, very important in terms of gauging your competitiveness for this program. Uh, schools are also going to look at your undergraduate performance. Um, you know, top schools have an undergrad GPA average of something around, you know, 3.6, 3.7. If you're bringing in a 2.9 GPA, you know, at, at a place like Stanford, Stanford would have to admit four people with a 4.0 to make up for admitting someone with a 2.9 in order to maintain their GMAT average. So that undergrad performance is important. Um, your work experience, uh, you know, beyond just the number of years, the average the 80% range at all the top programs for years of work experience is kind of three to eight years. Um, 
you want to be in that range to be competitive. If you're outside the range on the low end or on the high end, you're really going to need to explain why now is the right time for you to be getting an MBA. And maybe you should be thinking about, um, you know, if you are on that high end of work experience, to a two-year MBA may not be the best option for you. There are lots of great alternatives out there for, um, you know, in terms of fit, even at some of these top programs. So, um, Carol, did you have an example of kind of competitiveness and in, in someone you've worked with, with yeah, respect you know, to you know, being competitive and, sure. and picking the right school? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And it really goes a couple of different directions. You know, certainly, Susan, I know you and I both work with folks who are close to 4.0, you know, cl uh, close to 760, 770. And it's really interesting what that process looks like. You know, just recently I had one of my clients accepted to Stanford. He did not get accepted to HBO and got wait, uh, HBS and got waitlisted at Wharton. You know, similarly last year I had a client who's now at HBS who didn't got a, did not get a interview at either Stanford or Wharton. And what a lot has to do with is these schools are very, very competitive now. Something like 10% of the Wharton class is going to have a 780 or above. So what you really have to do is make a connection to the school and have them really understand, you know, why you need to be there rather than some other school. Because candidly, that's also why they're going to want you there. You know, they want people who want to be there. And I cannot overstate right now just how important it is to make yourself Create a great story for yourself through essays. Explain why an MBA, why now, why that particular school. Visit, make connections, as, as Susan talked about, because it also works the other way. You know, I was looking at, at some statistics yesterday in the GMAT range at Stanford is 590 up to 790, I think. So, of course, your GMAT, you better be above average, but, you know, take heart. Under certain cir circumstances, they'll look beyond GMAT score and probably GPA as well. At the same point, you have to imagine who that 590 was at Stanford. One can only imagine, you know, some an astronaut or something who's truly exceptional. But, but the point here not to be lost is you need to tell an entire story. GMAT, GPA are just parts of the story, but if your GMAT or GPA are low, then you really have to sharpen your story and you really have to explain who you are to make that connection to the schools, particularly the top schools that you're interested in. And speaking of connections, let's move on to the the next slide on connections. Yeah. And whoops. Carol, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So, you know, connections really works across a few different dimensions. And one of the worst things you can do is look at the top 10 list of schools, write a single essay, and send it over to all the different schools. And the reason for that, these are very, very different schools, and they want you to understand that, and they want you to be able to articulate that. And the way that you start getting this information is by talking to everybody. That includes students who are there how they're enjoying the program, what they're interested in, what their focus is. It includes obviously alumni, maybe alumni who you work with regularly and you can really have a heart to heart with them. The admission staff really is there for as a resource for you. The best thing you can do with the admission staff though is ask them real questions. You know, that shows that you've done your research and it also shows just how interested you are. And finally, industry leaders. You know, take note of where some of the, you know, maybe some of the folks who you see as role models, where they went to school. Try to understand, you know, what impact schools had on them. If you're lucky, you can have that conversation. And if you're like most of us, you'll have to dig around a little bit. But again, connections are so important so that you don't end up saying the same thing to every top 10 school, because that really is a recipe, you know, for not getting into a lot of these places. Yeah, excellent. And I find, you know, in terms of making connections, one thing I advise my clients to do is, is find that personal connection first. Don't look for that opportunistic, oh, I need to talk to the president of the consulting or investment banking club. Reach out to students who, you know, have a shared interest with you. you know, so if you really enjoy playing tennis, perhaps there's a tennis club, and that's a good place to start. Or perhaps you are a uh, former military, and you can reach out to the Veterans Club and make some connections there and use that a jump, as a jumping off point for engaging with students who are more closely affiliated with um, your career interests. 
in the long term through that MBA program. Many schools will have on their website links to ambassadors that, you know, you might scroll through a list of 20 or 30 students and just find someone who perhaps went to your undergrad and you can feel comfortable reaching out to them and, and connecting on that shared experience. So I think moving on from, con from connections, uh, the next C, lost my mouse here, is curriculum. Yeah. So this is really the guts of what business school is about. You know, you're, you're going to business school to be a student, you know, not just to get a job, you need to do learning. So what does lo that learning mean? You know, first thing you should think about in terms of assessing your fit with particular schools is, you know, what's the teaching methodology? And does it align with what your needs are? Um, you know, the case method is, you know, used probably at all schools in some capacity. At other, other schools, it's used almost exclusively. Um, the case method, as, as some of our, uh, you know, some people who have gone to Harvard will say, you know, it's not the best way to learn accounting. Um, you know, you're not going to become an accountant after, after learning, doing financial accounting through the case method. So think about, you know, how you, how you learn what you're most comfortable with and whether or not the teaching methodology at a particular program aligns with your needs. The next is to look at core curriculum. Although the core is going to be pretty standard across all schools, you know, you're going to be taking basically all the functions of marketing, accounting, finance, operations, um, human resources, et cetera. Some schools will allow you to place out of some of the core. You know, at uh, Booth, it's an incredibly flexible curriculum. At Stanford, on the other hand, they had, have leveled curriculum for some of the core classes, specifically around quantitative um, classes like statistics and accounting. So if you are, really strong in statistics, you're not in a class with someone who hasn't taken math since high school, you're going to be in a higher level statistics class and going deeper and really looking perhaps at data mining or something along those lines. So think about, you know, how those each school does their core curriculum. At a school like HBS, regardless of whether what your background is, you're sitting in the same classroom with everyone. There's no placing out of anything. You take all the same classes. Electives. Um, again, every school does this differently. You know, are, what are the electives that are interesting to you? you know, if you have an interest in going into the energy sector, are there energy-specific electives that you may might take? Um, some schools will offer majors or concentrations or pathways even at a school like Kellogg. Um, if you want to go really deep in a particular area, you might want to be looking at schools that offer those concentrations or majors or perhaps a certificate in finance to demonstrate your proficiency in that particular area. If you really want just a general management degree, you can dabble across electives. Um, and I'll let Harold share some story, you know, a story sure. about you know, clients that he's worked with where curriculum and doing research on that really drew out some schools that clients may not have considered. You know, absolutely, absolutely. I'm laughing to myself that the client I'm thinking of is uh, an American, but he spent the last couple of years in Edmonton, Alberta. And I have to say, I have never had a client that far north. Uh, in, in any case, you know, he was a guy, very technical guy, very interested in the future, if you will. Had the choice between Carnegie Mellon, Tepper, and Foster at the University of Washington, both great schools. Each of them was really, you know, interesting to him for a few different reasons. Foster, because it was close to where he was, great school. He could get, you know, great job at a brand name company. The other one was Carnegie Mellon Tepper, which right now is just about the hottest school out there regularly rising in the rankings and Pittsburgh is a wonderful city and very entrepreneurial. It also turns out that that Tepper and Carnegie Mellon generally has have a focus on robotics for the last decades and finally it is becoming a real real interesting industry for the world of venture capital, for the world of startups. So given this curriculum, given an actual curriculum you know, courses in robotics, some of the courses in some of the engineering schools, that was overwhelming for him. At that point, you know, Carnegie Mellon was going to be the place for him. The fact that they threw in, uh, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars because he was so, uh, you know, such an interesting person, you know, certainly helped with that decision. But this was where he really recognized he could take courses, maybe a couple of the business school, but really across campus that would supplement and allow him to create the 
curriculum he wanted. You know, there's other examples as well. You know, I'm a MIT Sloan guy, so I'm very familiar with the sustainability curriculum that they put together to the put point that you can have a certificate of sustainability, which really is the exclamation point on what you've been studying. You know, every school, no matter what, everywhere from HBS on down, will have their focus in terms of curriculum and really just what the chatter is around the community. You know, Susan, I know you went to Duke at Fuqua. You know, I know healthcare there is, is so central to all that they do. Some, a place like Columbia has made a real effort to have courses and lecturers and interesting things happening in terms of cybersecurity. So it's worth looking at the curriculum through your own lens and seeing, you know, what are the touch points for you? Yeah, and I think that's so important that it's through your own lens because, you know, someone might go to Columbia for cybersecurity, someone else might go there for value investing and everything that Columbia does around value investing. So there are those little pockets at every school. And if you find those, you can write really compelling applications around those specifics. And, and the schools get very excited that people have discovered these gems within uh, their offerings. So with that, we'll move past curriculum to the next. Oh, and finally, curriculum, and this kind of is a good lead into clubs because experiential learning is so important of being able to take what you've learned in the classroom and do, and do in an environment where it's okay to fail. You're going to get feedback from your peers, from you know advisors and professors who are, are guiding you through this process but you're going to do perhaps a hands-on project some of those are part of curriculum others are part of the club and there are lots of clubs at any any school um, there are going to be professional clubs that are aligned with your goals like the marketing club or the finance club or the operations club or perhaps uh, the health care club or the energy club those are all great clubs, um, great opportunities to build networks and develop relationships with people who are in they in careers that are related to where you want to go. Uh, there are also identity and interest clubs, which are great opportunities to develop your leadership skills that anyone going to an MBA program should be working on. Um, and for example, here, perhaps you are a passionate soccer player, and maybe you take a leadership role in the soccer club, and you work on developing your skills with uh, organizing the team and scheduling and going out and negotiating uh, field time to practice on and ensuring that referees show up. Don't underestimate the value of taking a leadership role in something that is really of interest to you because you can still work on all of those leadership and soft skills. Um, Many of the professional clubs at schools will provide opportunities for you to get involved in organizing and executing conferences, seminars, speaker series. Uh, again, these are great opportunities for you to work on your, your leadership skills, your time management skills, and they're also um, a great chance to engage with industry leaders in the industry that you're looking for. So you might be identifying speakers to come in uh, to sit on a panel for say the healthcare conference. And in reaching out to these people, you're developing relationships that could serve you well in the long term in terms of your career. If you're interested in consulting, case competitions are a great opportunity to kind of get familiar with um, cases and you know prepare to be able to do case interviews when you're when you're coming out of business school and interviewing with these companies. If you're an investment person, a lot of schools will offer a student-run portfolio. In some cases, th these are super competitive to get on the team that's going to run the portfolio. And in being part of that team, you may have access to mentors who are alumni or professionals in the investment industry who will serve as you know, mentors for you, not just during your time in business school, but beyond. So look for those opportunities. And um, also part of you know, these outside opportunities are career tracks. So even if you want to go into, into perhaps technology, you don't have to be in the Bay Area or in Boston. You could end up in Chicago, uh, yet perhaps the high tech club does a spring break trip to go visit um, a bunch of technology firms in the Bay Area. So these are great opportunities to not only visit these companies, but guess what? 
students are running these tracks. So they're identifying the companies they want to visit. Students are reaching out to alumni at those companies to schedule time to get in there. Again, working on your leadership skills and other soft skills in, in putting these activities together. Yep. I um, think that's and these, go ahead, Harold. Well, yeah, no, no, I think this is absolutely right. You know, across a couple of different dimensions. First of all, you spend time who have similar interests to you, which is always fun, as well as you make connections, very informal connections with folks who are maybe doing the job you want to do. It is always the case that the organizers of the MIT Venture Capital Conference, which is a very big conference, end up getting jobs in venture capital. When you spend as much time as they do talking to venture capitalists, scheduling with venture capitalists, maybe sometimes during the conference going out to dinner with venture capitalists, it is very natural when the venture capitalist sees their resume come across the desk that, of course, they know you already. Of course, that's a great entree. And I also laugh, though, depending on the school, you have opportunities. The bigger the school, you may not have other schools. You know, I joke because at HBS, you know, they have three clubs. One is the Whiskey, Bourbon, and Spirits Club. The other is the wine and cuisine club, and the other is the brew club. And I laugh at it because, first of all, they obviously do a lot of drinking at HBS, which which I I, I personally knew about. Um, but also this idea here of they're they're big enough to be small, meaning when you have about two thousand MBAs walking around the campus, you know you can really get this balkanization of all sorts of different clubs. You know the flip side is it may be at a smaller school, even though there may be fewer clubs, you just develop much closer relationships with the folks who you know there. So again, wonderful opportunities to learn outside of the classroom. And I think, Susan, you even were the organizers for one of the tracks, uh, you know, when you were at Duke. Yeah, actually, when I, when I was at Duke, um, I had moved from Boston down to North Carolina. And not that I had my heart set on getting back to Boston, but you know, my family was all in Boston. So I was going to be spending my breaks up in Boston. And the marketing club, had the previous year put together a, a marketing week in New York and visited a bunch of companies. And I said my first year, like, Hey, well, why don't we do a marketing week in New York in Boston? And so I identified about, you know, 12, 15 students who were interested in marketing and were interested in getting to the Boston area. And we put together um, a marketing week in Boston and went and visited a bunch of entirely different companies. Uh, I think we visited, um, Fidelity Investments, Lotus Development, uh, Stride Right Shoes, um, Ocean Spray Cranberries, Hasbro Toys, you know, some biotech firms that may or may not exist anymore, some technology firms that may or may not exist anymore. But the point being that when I went to start, you know, networking for a job, I ended up getting a job at one of the companies we had visited. And by the time I started, people thought that I had been a summer intern there because I knew enough people. Uh, they're like, wait a minute, didn't you intern for Larry last summer? I'm like, no, Larry, I just met through th this event that uh, he helped me to orchestrate. And I wasn't the only one who ended up with a job based out of the connections that were made through that trek. And I believe that that trek may still go on today, which is, you know, 20 <clears throat> something years later. All right. So moving on beyond clubs, um, community and culture. And I'll let Harold take this one. Sure. You know, what this really is about is, are your people at the school that you're choosing? You know, is this a place where you breathe the air, you feel comfortable? And let me give you my own example. I, like many of our counselors, had the choice of a number of different schools. And I visited a lot of them. One of the last time I visited was MIT. And as, a, as soon as I walked in there, they had me at hello. Yeah, you know, just looking around who the people were, who, what they were doing, it was jeans and t-shirt sort of people. I, of course, also looked at HBS, and that was sort of, you know, khakis, button-down shirt sort of people. So between the two, MIT was, was certainly a place I felt more comfortable. You know, and frequently you're going to see differences that are unexpected. You know, MIT versus Harvard, yes, both Boston, you know, a couple miles away from each other, but very different. Stanford versus Haas. I was there last year. Again, you could not imagine two more different schools. And then also recognizing that some schools have very similar cultures. And if you're thinking of one, maybe you should think of all of them. You know, I tease folks when I talk about Duke, Tuck, and Yale being these sort of shiny, happy people schools. You know, all small, great cultures, very supportive of each other in a way that maybe some other schools aren't. And really, the best way of understanding this is by going to visit. 
So if you do not yet have plans to go and visit, and, and obviously there has to be some practicality involved here, I would really encourage it. Not just again because you're going to be making a connection to these schools and being able to speak more or have a better application focused for each of these schools, but also to get a sense of who these people are and are they your sorts of people. And this is something that's frequently underestimated, particularly if you're only applying to the you know top seven schools, whatever it is, but it works both ways. It's not just that you feel comfortable at that school, but that school feels comfortable with you. So for example, of a school that you know we all know very well here at Stratus, that we know a lot of schools very well, you know, a place like Columbia, they're gonna read your resume, look at you, and uh, you're gonna go for an interview. And, and candidly, they're also gonna be asking the question, are you a Columbia type of person? So not only does it make sense for you to connect with these schools to understand their culture, but also in some ways being able to communicate how you fit there. Yeah, and I can't emphasize this enough. I, I had a client uh, I worked with a year ago who was from L.A., had gone to UCLA, know she, knew she wanted to be in L.A., and I didn't know a lot about UCLA, UCLA Anderson at that time, but I knew after spending some time getting to know this client that she needed to be in a really collaborative and team-oriented environment, and you know, proposed a couple of East Coast schools and, and set it up for her as if this is kind of like a study abroad. You can always go back to L.A. You know, think about like expanding your horizons and going east of the Mississippi for, you know, not even two years. And in the end, um, she's at Duke, which, you know, not surprising since I went to Duke, but she visited. She actually went to an information center session in L.A. and fell in love. And a week later, found her way to campus and. I connected with her shortly after her visit, and as Harold said, you know, they had her at hello. Um, just the welcome environment that she felt. She said, I never felt that way at UCLA, and I went to UCLA undergrad. I never felt that anyone cared about me the way they did at Duke. So, you know, make those visits if you can do it, uh, because you're going to learn so much more in just two hours on campus, watching students interact with one another, watching them interact with staff and with professors, and you can't learn that by reading a blog or attending a webinar. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Susan, I'm going to remind you of one of your clients, and let me tell first about my client. This past year, I had a client who, again, was now at Stanford, and honestly, we all knew he wasn't going to get into HBS. He's just not that sort of person. He was a Stanford person. And Susan, I think you had a client, what was it, who didn't get into HBS but got into every other M7 school, if I remember correctly? Yep, yep I did. And uh, you know, this guy you know, had in his heart that he needed to go to HBS. And I knew that it was not the right place for him. He got into Stanford, Wharton, Kellogg, and Booth but not to Harvard. And he was heartbroken. I said, you didn't belong at Harvard. Like, it, it's not the school for you. And he is a very happy, you know, summer intern out in the Bay Area and will be returning to Stanford this fall. You know, that's the right place for him. He was very much, um, you know, a team player in that collaborative environment at, at Stanford was the right place for him. Th so, that's, what, that's right. So, let's so, move so. on. If, go ahead, Harold. I'm going to go yeah, to the next slide. Yeah, here. yeah. You know, just one final point is just the nature of our clients. You know, the private equity folks. I think the last year, and I don't remember across the firm. I think I personally connected with about five or six folks who are going to be starting at HBS this fall. And I lead a, lead, read a lot of private equity resumes. And I have to tell you, I can know. I honestly can know the difference between who's getting into HBS and who isn't most of the time. You know, because I know what an HBS person looks like as you know, Susan, as we all do, you know, have different sense of the profiles and where they'll end up. And I think this really is, you know, a point of differentiation for us as Stratus is because we not just know the schools very well, we know the personality of the schools very well. And that really does make a difference. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about costs. You know, the reality here, uh, you all know, you guys are making good salaries and uh, to go to business school means, you know, in most instances, sacrificing that salary for two years with the expectation that coming out of business school, you will be doing way better financially than you're doing now. But there may be loans to pay off and it may take some time, but you know, cost is a factor here. 
So some things to think about in terms of cost is the cost of living. Um, so I was actually out at Stanford last, I guess it's no longer last month, in June, and got a tour of their magnificent new dorms that are right across from where the classrooms are. To, to stay in a one-bedroom, which is basically like a hotel room, $2,100 a month. And that's kind of the best, lowest cost option of living in Palo Alto, California for a student at Stanford. Um, compare that instead with if I had $2,100 to spend here in North Carolina, I could probably rent a really nice house for my family of six. Um, so that's something to consider you know, beyond the, the, the cost of um, just the tuition. Think about uh, partner fellowships that are available. You know, if you are a woman, make sure you're part of the Forte Foundation. They offer, you know, schools that are partnered with Forte offer great fellowships for women who support other women in business. It's a great opportunity. Um, consortium is a great resource, not only for the financial support that you would get as a, a consortium fellow at one of their partner schools, but for all the other resources that come with consortium. Yellow ribbon, if you're military or formal, former military, great way to try to, you know, to finance your education. And there are also targeted scholarships. Like, who would have thought that, you know, if you're a marketing person, you should be applying to Booth? You know, if you're going to stay in Chicago, why wouldn't you go to Kellogg? The reality is Booth has fellowships. So not just scholarships, but fellowships that include mentorship with a, you know, a CMO of a top um, company for marketing people through their Kilts um, Marketing Institute. Great opportunities. There are other schools like Darden that offer um, the Jefferson Fellowship to, you know, it's a, you may have received an email about it. You know, if you've got a solid uh, GMAT score, I think it's either 720, 730 or above, Darden probably reached out to you and encouraged you to apply for their Jefferson Fellowship. So think about those costs. I actually worked with a client two years ago who came to me Really solid stats, great work. She probably could have gotten into a place like Wharton. She wanted to go into finance. And she said to me, you know, Susan, I'm really debt averse. I don't want to pay for my MBA. So, you know, we dug into, you know, where she would be a remarkable and outstanding student. And you know, she was admitted to multiple schools and ended up choosing to go to IU Kelly, where she was offered a Dean's Fellowship. And you know, she was sitting at the table with the dean and a bunch of professors before she even committed to going to the school. She's not going to pay a nickel for her school. And you know, she, she reached out to me six weeks into her first year and said, Susan, I got the dream investment banking um, summer internship already because she was part of, you know, got access to different people because of that fellowship. So cost is a very important factor. And Harold, you've got some examples of uh, of cost playing in as well. Yes, yes, I do, and and particularly a couple of folks who came to us, saying very openly just how important price and cost was for them, and we pointed them to schools that honestly had not even been on their list. I have a client right now, former military. He got out of the military. He was very open to this idea that you know he didn't have a lot of money. His scores were just okay. So we pointed him to Washington University in St. Louis, where he is there now in a full military scholarship. So, so again, this connection between what schools you know are right for this person, what schools actually have some money to pass around, uh, we have some experience with that. And in this case, it really was a home run. I also had a client last year who was coming from abroad, again, sort of mediocre scores. Um, but honestly, he was so enthusiastic, and he basically said, I will go anywhere if I could have a scholarship. So though he hadn't heard of it, of it I had pointed him towards Northeastern University. It's a, it happens to be a great business school, just had a, you know, a huge amount of money uh, given to it. It has a deep relationship with the finance community in Boston, so a lot of folks end up going to Wellington or Fidelity. In any case, he got a full ride there. And for him, this is life-changing. He simply would not have been able to come to business school in the U.S. without it. And as we try to think about what is best for a candidate, you know, after some conversation, cost for many is really a defining factor. And we certainly take that into account and sort of adjust our recommendations and strategy based on that need. Excellent. Well, thanks, Harold. So in, in terms of creating your own top 10 list, um, a couple things that, that we like to talk about is, you know, 
take into consideration all these fees that we've talked about, you know, beyond just those national rankings. And if you're going to put a list, put together a list of 10 schools, think about having three stretch schools. And these are ones where, hey, this would be a dream to go here. You know, it could be a bunch of M7 schools. And even if you've got strong stats, those are all still going to be stretch schools. Um, we like to have our clients have four target schools. So these are ones where you're kind of right at the averages um, in terms of the GMAT and GPA and work experience. And then three schools where you're solidly above the averages and you're likely to be admitted to these schools. You know, and beyond that, you, know, you might take different strategies on applying. You might shoot high this year and just apply to two or three of those really stretch schools. And if you don't get in, that's okay. You're, you're comfortable with your job, still opportunities to grow there, and you can apply next year and go a little bit deeper down in your list. But we also have clients who, you know, apply to the you know, three stretch schools and two target schools in round one. And if they come up empty handed, um, they'll turn right around in round two, do five more schools, uh, including, you know, two more target schools and three likely schools. So, you know, think strategically about how you're going to approach your applications and your own top 10 list. But it's really important for you to think about, you know, what's important to you and how is any particular school going to get you from where you are today to where you want to be? And that really is independent of what the national rankings are. So with that, um, how can Stratus help you? Uh, you know, honestly, Harold and I have been doing all the talking for the last 45 minutes or so. We don't know until we, until you start the conversation with us. We do know, though, that less than 20% of successful applicants do it on their own. It means that people have help. Um, Harold talked a lot about our team. All of our counselors have MBAs from top programs. We've got on our team decades of mentoring, coaching, and admissions committee experience. And we really share that knowledge across our team. So in terms of next steps, please do reach out to us for a free consultation. You can do that in a few ways. You can email us at consult at stratusadmissions.com, or you can give us a call at 646-690-7369. And because you have attended this webinar, uh, you can get 5% off through August 15th if you mention Dream Schools 5 um, when you sign up with us. And we do have about 10 minutes that we can answer questions. I would appreciate it if you guys when we wrap up, could answer some quick survey questions at the end. But I do thank you for coming to the Stratus and Beats GMAT webinar today. And I'm going to look through some questions here and tee some up for um, perhaps for Harold or for myself. Um, so. Kapil, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, wants to know Ross versus Haas versus Booth versus Kellogg for con technology consulting product manager career path. Um, so Harold, your thoughts on that? Wh Ross, Haas, Booth, Kellogg for con technology consulting or product manager. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, Haas certainly comes to mind. Uh, um, just given its location, the one thing I will say, it's a small program. So at that point, you certainly want to connect with some of the other programs. And the best way of answering this question is by asking these schools directly, because that works for you across a couple different dimensions. First of all, you know, you get your answer. Uh, second of all, they begin to see who you are and understand that you have some very specific goals. But off the top of my head, it's certainly Haas. You know, that said, Ross is just a terrific school across, you know, many different dimensions. So I would certainly look at those two in my mind as being sort of the, the you know, the top of the pyramid. But, but Susan, do you have more thoughts on that? Yeah, so I would actually, you know, throw out another school to consider. Um, Harold talked about it earlier, Carnegie Mellon Tepper. Uh, they placed this past year 10% of their class, 10% of their class went to Amazon, many of them probably in product management roles. So, you know, throw that out, great technology school. Um, you know, look at these, look at the schools that have really strong engineering programs in addition to, to business school programs. Um, you know, if you are in the, the tech space, NYU just announced their new one-year tech MBA program. If tech is a space for you, you may be able to knock out an MBA in one year and land that dream product manager job. So you're only giving, sacrificing one year of, a, of your um, 
salary and you may end up where you want to be. So that's something to consider. All right, so we've got another question here from Adam, wants to know, for Darden's Jefferson Fellowship, is it possible to apply the, for the fellowship in September and then to Darden in round two? Um, the email they sent was a bit unclear. And congrats on that killer GMAT, Adam. Uh, my read of that letter that um, some of our clients received is that in order to be considered for um, the Jefferson Fellowship, you need to apply in round one, that October deadline for Darden. You cannot wait until January. So they have to have your application in hand before they would invite you for their Jefferson Fellowship kind of pick weekend, which happens in November. So the Jefferson Fellowship application, I think, is due first week in September, and you would need to have your Darden application in a month later in October. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, all right, well, wait another second here for any other questions. Oh, um, we got a question. If undergrad scores, scores are below 3.0 GPA, how else can one excel in order to be considered for an M7 school? Um, great question. I think it's Mumbi, Mumbai. Uh, you may consider taking some additional classes um, to demonstrate that today you are a different student than you were when you had a, a low GPA during your undergrad. Um, those might include I would encourage, you know, quant-focused classes if that's not a strength for you. Um, there are online classes at UCLA and uh, UC Berkeley on, like, math for management. Um, another program that's available that you might consider is the HBX core program. It's a little bit more pricey than doing just one class, and it's um, very comprehensive. Um, and interesting that Laurel just asked, um, do, the, do programs like HBX provide a benefit in showing some interest in business? Um, yes, they do. Uh, you know, especially for someone who may not have a quantitative background, doing HBX core shows that you have some proficiency there. Um, Mumbi asked the follow-up question, are edX or Coursera classes okay? And the answer there is no. You really need to have a a transcript at the end of your class to demonstrate that you have something well above that below 3.0 that you had during your undergrad time. Um, Peter wants to know what strategy do you recommend when it comes to selecting recommenders? Um, oh, lots of questions here, Peter. Um, in terms of recommenders, really you should have your current immediate supervisor write your recommendations. If that's not possible, you need to explain that in an optional essay. Um, and ways to compensate for a potentially lower GMAT score. Depending on if it's, if it's softer on the quant or verbal, there are different ways to approach that, Peter. Um, if it's softer on the quant side, you could take uh, you know, a math class to demonstrate that you are proficient on the math side. If it's softer on the verbal side, you know, it's less concerning. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Kapil has another question. Is part-time MBA worth it compared to full-time? Ross, Haas, or other great B-scale programs. You know what? At you know, Ross has a fabulous program. Haas's part-time program is wonderful. At the end of these programs, you have an MBA from Michigan or from UC Berkeley or from Booth. Uh, at some of these schools, you would be sitting in a classroom with full-time MBA students. You know, it really depends on where you are in your career and whether or not uh, you're in a position to take two years off. If you are older in your career, frequently those, uh, you know, a weekend program or an evening program may be a better fit for you. Um, and, you know, you can continue to work and really apply what you're learning in real time uh, during your MBA program rather than stepping away for two years. So um, definitely reach out to us. Um, and ask Peel. We can talk to you about part-time MBAs. There's actually an article on our website. Today is Tom Brady's birthday, and uh, in honor of Tom Brady, I'll direct you to an article that's about, am I too old for an MBA? Reasons to consider, um, you know, options beyond the two-year full-time program, and it talks about how, you know, Tom Brady, despite the fact that I think he's 40, 40 today, is hands down, best uh, quarterback in the NFL, and Harold will not argue with me on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, you, you can't, you, it's hard to get into an MBA program if you're 40 years old. Um, 
I think we have time for maybe one more question and I'm going to give this one over to Harold. How can you evaluate a school's ability to place career changers? Sure. Al is asking this question. Yes, sure. First of all, sometimes that is will require you to going into career services and having a conversation with them. Uh, so something else to consider is, and every school has this, is pull their employment report. And you can get a sense from there where people come from and where people go to. And at that point, maybe you can start figuring out, okay, are even people being placed in the industry that I want to be? And, and that really gives you uh, a general sense of things. But I have to tell you, most of the top programs can accommodate career changes very effectively. But, you know, again, your own situation where you're coming from is always going to be slightly different. So I would have no hesitation now of giving one of these career services a call and saying, OK, here's my situation. Tell me about similar experiences that you've had. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that, Al. I spent um, a week out in California back in June at the AGAT conference and spent time on campus at at Berkeley Haas, at Wharton San Francisco, at San Stanford, as well as at UCLA. And both Berkeley Haas and at UCLA spoke very highly of you know, the resources that they have in their career offices, where they have, you know, it's beyond just, you know, scheduling uh, students to go to, uh, you know, interviews with top tier programs. They have coaches, they take input from students of where the students' interests lie and what companies these students would like to work for. Um, at UCLA, they have hands down the best career center um, as voted by students. I think they said 96% of their, stu their student body is changing either career, excuse me, either industry or function and they do it successfully, they have great placement. If you wanna end up in California, go to one of those schools because despite the fact they draw from all over the world, like 70% of both of those schools they, you know, end up on the West Coast. 70% of graduates end up like in California or somewhere on the West Coast. Yeah. So with that, um, we're gonna wrap up because we're right here at the hour. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today, for taking the time. Please do reach out to us. Uh, give us a call, shoot us an email. We'll spend 30 minutes talking to you about your profile and schools that might be a right fit for you and how Stratus could help you get to your, your goals. And with that, I'm going to sign off. And please do take two minutes to fill out the survey here at the end. And I want to thank Beat the GMAT for hosting us today. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.